Hi, I'm Meredith Cohen. I'm an architectural historian specialized in medieval architecture. Today, I'm breaking down the architectural details of Hogwarts in the Harry Potter films. Let's look at the exterior of Hogwarts. There are a couple of elements in this castle that bring us back to monastic architectural complexes. And the first is the Great Hall, which in the earliest buildings from the Middle Ages, they would be a refectory in a monastery. And eventually those were adopted by monarchies to use them as throne rooms and great banqueting halls. And then halls such as that were also adopted into college and university architecture as their refectories and dining halls. In the center, we're looking at the very tall keep or dungeon, but don't get that confused with a dungeon. It has nothing to do with a prisoner's dungeon. It really is a type of architecture that was used for siege warfare. And normally that siege warfare type of architecture doesn't have any windows in it at all. So this is kind of an unusual adaptation. And it's got this conical roof with dormer windows in it, which also is very, very unusual. On the left, we're looking at a square block fortress type of building with a corner tower and a battlement which is corbelled out on a corbel table, that sort of round arches that you see there, and then a conical roof with a dormer window. To our left, we see another rectangular structure that is leading to a small bridge and a last rectangular structure on our left with many windows and a kind of stepped gable pattern. So looking at the side of this great hall here, we're looking at these buttresses capped by pinnacles, which reminds me of the profile of Christ Church Hall, which is a college at Oxford University. So we're looking at this window here, which is corbelled out from the wall like a bay window and filled with tracery. And although we would have a tracery window in a building from this age, it wouldn't be corbelled out as a bay window. That's something that was developed later on in the Renaissance and Tudor periods. A couple of things at the top of this gable is that you have this turret, a stair turret, sticking up right out of the top of the gable. So that's rather unusual. And then we have a couple of chimneys around in this view. So the central block here and the corner tower as well as the keep, reflect an earlier phase in castle architecture, a phase that's more typical of the 12th and 13th centuries. On the right here is a building that looks much more like church architecture or monastic architecture. It looks like a small chapel or a little hall. And this is from a later architectural period because of the detailing that we have on the buttresses with these pinnacles. And the detailing we see in these windows here with the tracery patterns, that would suggest just a late Gothic period of construction. The Louvre in Paris is a really good example of one of these castles that shows multiple phases of evolution. The origin of the Louvre, which was a castle built around 1200 based on a square plan and with a large tall keep, and you can still see that underground at the Louvre today. Then that castle built around 1200 was added onto by Charles V in the 14th century. And then over time, that castle was replaced and extended by many, many different wings and buildings. And it remained the royal castle all the way up to nearly the French Revolution, at which time the Louvre was turned into a museum. And so what we're seeing at Hogwarts is a similar type of amalgamation of different building types that are created over different time periods, from monastic, to castle architecture, to university architecture, religious architecture. And this informs us about the different periods over which Hogwarts was built, telling us that this is a place that has existed for a long, long time. So let's check out now what's inside the Great Hall. The first thing that jumps out at me here are the four longitudinal tables that represent the four different houses of Hogwarts. They're enclosed by alternating paneled walls with spaces for windows. We see a large chimney right here. Also on the walls are these fantastic beasts carved out on corbels, leading our eyes up from these tables. 
and moving perpendicularly is the high table, which is elevated on a platform and has chairs for the faculty to sit in. And at the center, there's a kind of throne that's where Dumbledore sat. And behind him is this large window. This reflects contemporary Great Hall that we see still today in Oxford and Cambridge colleges. It's based actually on a monastic refectory building type that goes all the way back to the 12th century. This Great Hall is fabled to have been inspired by Christ Church Hall at Oxford University, which is one of the most prestigious of the Oxford colleges. And so again, that inspiration is lending an air of authority and power and prestige to the setting of Hogwarts School. Let the feast begin. So at the high table, I see a chair that looks like the throne of the English kings. It's a Gothic throne. You can see a gable and pinnacles to either side. That's where Dumbledore sits. So that's equating Dumbledore with a kind of royalty. Professor Dumbledore would like to say a few words. The high table, it's always elevated. So faculty and their guests are elevated and perpendicular to the students below. Obviously, there's an implicit hierarchy there suggesting that the faculty to be respected a bit more. At the back of the Great Hall so is a bay window, but we don't really see its projection into deep space there from the inside. What we do see are these mullions, stone vertical braces that are holding the panels of windows in place. So Great Halls like this would often have one large fireplace for heat purposes. It had nothing to do with the kitchens. Again, fire is a dangerous thing, so it needs to stay under control. What is very unrealistic here is to see these kind of oil lamps burning aglow, candles everywhere, especially if you think of there was a wooden roof <laughs> or might have been a wooden roof. And even for stone, fire is a terrible thing. So that's emphasizing the magic here. On the opposite side of this room, there is a great pointed arch portal. And it seems that that is taken directly from Christ Church College at Oxford. The Great Hall is designed to remind us of the elite collegiate institutions of Oxford and Cambridge and Hogwarts is designed to look like one of them. Let's take a look at the Gryffindor common room. Gather around here. Welcome to the Gryffindor common room. What's so noticeable about this room are these beautifully colored red walls. And on top of these reddish walls are these old master paintings. And that's typical of these Oxford and Cambridge College common rooms. And throughout the colleges, they will have often portraits of old headmasters and portraits of famous people at all levels. Built a long time ago, they retain features that are part of earlier architecture, like the large fireplace, which makes it very cozy, or they might have this beautifully arched entranceway, and they're often filled with all kinds of knickknacks and tokens of the past that add to the coziness and charm of the room. Common rooms typically would have a fireplace to warm the room. This one is a particularly large one, so it suggests also that the room is large. At the same time, we have this chandelier where I, I don't know what the origin of, this is almost looks like one of these Byzantine heavenly Jerusalem <laughs> round chandeliers very unusual. This is a modern manufactured chandelier. Let's take a closer look now. What jumps out at me here are these red walls, which are actually one of two sets of the most famous tapestries that still exist in the world today. This is the set from the Cluny Museum of the Lady and the Unicorn. They're from the 1500s approximately, and they're extremely rare and extremely valuable and precious. The red tapestries are chosen because they're red and beautiful and on this thousand flower background and looking very medieval and cozy. So normally tapestries are hung onto the walls of an aristocratic household for insulation. So not only are they a kind of representation of wealth, but they also have a very practical purpose, which is they can decorate the household by being rolled up and unrolled and taken from one place to the next, but when they're actually hung up on the walls as insulation to keep the place warm, because these stone rooms are really cold. And so they look a little bit like wallpaper, but it's funny how it's been translated here at Hogwarts, where it's actually been translated 
as wallpaper that it's actually cut out along the form of the doorway there. They would definitely choose a tapestry that has a unicorn because there are unicorns in the Harry Potter movies and they are magical creatures. Drinking the blood of a unicorn will keep you alive even if you are an inch from death, but at a terrible price. As they were in the Middle Ages too, they were magical creatures, known for their magical properties, their horns were highly prized and valuable, and highly sought out and held in many treasuries. It's very unlikely that with tapestries at all, no less tapestries such as these ones, any painting would ever be put on them. They are the decoration themselves. You don't need to add another decoration on top of it, and certainly you would never want to poke a hole in it to hang up a painting over it. So the elaborate decoration of this common room is a testament to how Hogwarts is a place of great prestige and history. Let's take a look at another Hogwarts room that served multiple purposes. On Christmas Eve night, we and our guests gather in the Great Hall for a night of well-mannered frivolity. And here we are inside of a classroom in which Professor McGonagall is teaching the students how to dance. And what a beautiful room this is with these huge windows made of stone tracery. Very, very vertical. That's typical of what we call the perpendicular style. To the back, we also have multiple arches with this beautiful lace-like stone tracery, blind tracery on the wall, a pointed arch behind her. And what's really striking about this room is the vaults that come down and form these pendant vaults that you can see right here and here. It's like stone hanging from stone. It's kind of a reversal of nature for stone to be a pendant coming down from the roof. This space is the Divinity School at Oxford, which was built beginning in 1427 and first purpose-built university classroom. It was used for all different types of things. It's a multi-purpose room, and that's how we see it being used here. Now, place your right hand on my waist. What? It has these very, very large windows, which are now full of clear glass that let in a lot of bright white light. And originally, those windows probably would have been with grisaille, which is a kind of grayscale stained glass window, and probably made of silver stain, which creates a kind of yellow color. That was very popular in the later Middle Ages. They were still stained glass, but they were a little bit brighter than the deeply saturated color stained glass of earlier times. It's built in what is known as the perpendicular style, which you can see is this sort of more vertical decorative elements, but the ceiling here with these vaults that come down into these stone pendants, and it also had individual bosses with coats of arms on them, which suggests that those coats of arms are people who donated to the production of this room. That style there is more of the English decorated style. So this combination of decorated and perpendicular style is very typical of English late Gothic architecture. And so this is probably built in the late 15th century. Let's take a look at Professor McGonagall's classroom. Can you imagine the look in our McGonagall's face if we were late? So the first thing that jumps out at me here are these really impressive interlocking round arches. And as they interlock each round arch, they form a kind of pointed arch. And they're standing on tall, thin colonnettes, which are capped by capitals. These capitals are not sculpted, but this kind of interlocking arch is very, very typical of the Norman period of architecture, which was most fully developed in England after the conquest of England by William the Conqueror in 1066. So this space is the chapter house of Durham Cathedral, an entire cathedral that was built after the Norman conquest in England in the late 11th century. This is not a classroom at all. This is a small little room to the side of the cathedral that is being used as a classroom for Harry Potter films, but is actually a wonderful Norman structure. So a chapter house is a place where the clergy would congregate every day to read a rule from their monastic order. So one thing that's really fascinating about Norman architecture 
particularly as it gets adapted and adopted in England, is this very linear quality to it. And that's what we see in these interlocking arches. This seems to be a kind of indigenous English fascination with linear forms that may go all the way back to their kind of Anglo-Saxon and Celtic roots. This love of line and interlace that's being expressed through this Norman architecture here. So it's really a kind of nice symbiosis between Norman architecture, which comes from Normandy in France, and now it's being integrated with this kind of interlocking linear style that's so typical of England. Let's take a look now at the hallways of Hogwarts. I don't want to take potions. This Quidditch show's coming up. I need to practice. So what jumps out at me here is the very intricate tracery we see on the right side that's really beautiful. Pointed arches with lobes on the inside there, all of stone tracery. This is a vaulted hallway, and on the left side, it's enclosed with windows. One of the more unique aspects of this space are these really beautiful vaults that are made entirely of stone. When you make a stone vault like this out of two different arches, there's a kind of uncomfortable comfortable meeting point between the arch that goes across the space and the arch that is perpendicular to the side of that space. And what the architects have done here has been to cover it up with this fan-like decorative structure to cover up that uncomfortable meeting point of these two perpendicular arches. Enjoying ourselves, are we? Well, I had a free period this morning, Professor. So I noticed. This was filmed at the Cloister of Gloucester Cathedral, which is very, very famous for these really beautiful fan vaults, one of the earliest of their kind, if not the earliest, built in the 1430s. A cloister is a central square that is an essential feature of the monastic plan. It acts as a kind of throughway around the monastery that allows people to move from one building to the next without getting wet. Let's take a look at the courtyard. But no one's died in years. Someone will vanish occasionally, but they'll turn up in a month or two. <laughs> oh, go on, Harry. Quidditch is great. What jumps out at me are these very, very tall walls that are pierced with windows and kind of arched spaces. There's a great gateway on the side and then, of course, this open space where the students are walking from one place to the next. So this space is what is known as a bailey. It is the inner courtyard of a castle between a curtain wall and then the main structure of the castle. This is a space where horses would be kept. It's where knights would be fixing their regalia and their weapons and polishing things. Very practical space too. And on the left, we look at these sort of empty arcades here that could have been used for storage. As we look at the wall in the background, it's hard to tell, but they probably lead on to rooms behind it. So this part is all castle. I don't see any sort of mixed building types here. This is all defensive fortification and residential type castle. This was filmed at Alnwick Castle in Northern England, which actually still belongs to the Duke of Northumberland in its 12th iteration. And his name is Hugh Percy, and it still belongs in the Percy family, which has owned this castle since the 14th century. They are not living in the entire castle, just a small part of it, but this is part of the continuity that exists in old world Europe. And you can tell by looking at this image that the upper parts of the stone and parts of them are darker and other parts are lighter. So that's showing the sign of age. Obviously the darker stones are the older stones, Stones. Lighter ones such as here and here and here and here may even be stone replacements when the stone goes bad and starts to sort of dissolve. So right here on the right, this little slit here is an arrow loop. See how narrow it is? And it would have been opened out on the inside just for the size of a man to sit within it and point the bow and arrow outward for defense. So this is actually a very defensive gateway. It probably would have had layers of defense, a portcullis, a downward dropping iron gate, and there would have been murder holes inside too that allow people to throw stones at any enemies trying to get into the castle from there. So this setting adds to the narrative that Hogwarts is a really old institution and has a lot of history behind it. Those are the architectural details I noticed about Hogwarts. Let me know what you think in the comments.